Welcome everyone. Uh, this is the fifth uh, webinar as part of the Sustainability Grand Tour. Uh, my name is Magdalena Hajdukiewicz and I am a member of Engineers Ireland West Region Committee uh, who are delighted to host today's event. Um, the Sustainability Grand Tour is a continuous professional development series, uh, seminar series organized by a number of regions and sectors uh, within Engineers Ireland. And this is a really good opportunity to explore the role of engineers in developing more sustainable cities and communities. Uh, the Sustainability Grand Tour aims to demonstrate how engineers can integrate sustainability into their projects uh, at all stages. So starting from the design to the end of life. Um, and today's, uh, today's webinar, um, Integrating UN Sustainable Development Goals into Daily Practice will be presented by Dr. Kara Augustenborg. Uh, Kara is a fellow in environmental policy at University College Dublin. Uh, she is a presenter of the Down to Earth series on uh, Newstock FM, and she's also an honorary member of President Michael D. Higgins Council of State. Um, last year, Kara was named the Woman of Influence uh, at the Irish Women's Awards, uh, and Newstock FM hails her as the media authority on all things environmental. Um, so there will be a number of other events uh, in the future as part of the uh, of the Sustainability Grand Tour, and you can see you can see the schedule here. Uh, and the next week's event is uh, on the government's climate action bill with Brian Ladin. So, uh, so I hope you look into that schedule and maybe book uh, other events as well. So um, I'm really looking forward to, to this talk and I hope you will enjoy it. Um, if there are any questions, uh, if you think of anything or there's anything that you want to ask Cara during the talk, please type uh, your question in the Q&A box and we will come back to them uh, at the end of this uh, webinar. So Cara, you're very welcome at the Sustainability Grand Tour and the floor is yours. Thanks, Magda. That, uh, that agenda there looks fascinating. I think you might have to crash some of your events. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen before I start, if that's okay. There we go. Okay, hopefully you can see that. So good evening, everybody. And thanks so much for, for inviting me to speak at this event. Um, Magda might have mentioned there that I'm an environmental scientist by training. And so I really love these kind of events where someone from my discipline is invited to speak to people in a different discipline like yours. And in my years of working on environmental issues, I've noticed that scientists and engineers have a very different approach to problem solving. And I hope I'm not generalizing here, but uh, I find that engineers are always masterful at designing solutions to problems. While environmental scientists like me tend to focus on not causing problems in the first place, or perhaps just measuring and observing problems and uh, occasionally freaking out about them, uh, as I sometimes do. And, and I think by combining our respective approaches, uh, along with those from other disciplines like social justice and economics and health and law, that's really essential to solving the big global problems we face today. So thanks for taking time out of your evening to hear one perspective on these problems. Um, I should also add that early in my career as an environmental scientist, I became really frustrated with the fact that politicians and governments weren't aligning their policies to science. Um, in fact, you could probably argue that a lot of the policies enacted in Ireland over the last few decades were blatantly harmful to the environment, like our transport and agricultural policies and their impact on emissions and climate change and water quality. So over time, I moved away from the sciences and into policy and advocacy. Um, to try and ensure that policies were more aligned to science. So my focus this evening is going to be more related to policy than science, but I'm, I'm happy to take questions about environmental science issues like climate change too. So I was asked to speak to you about the sustainable development goals. Uh, and I think I should start by confessing that when they were first launched in 2015, I was a bit of a skeptic. Um, many of my colleagues were publicly welcoming them as a game changer and even involved in developing them. Uh, and they felt that this would really pave the way for meeting the urgent environmental, political and economic challenges that are facing our world. But um, to me, they seemed a bit policy wonky with lots of vague ambitions that I didn't really think would create 
meaningful impact. Um, however, since I, you know, I still have some criticisms about the goals and, I, and I'll talk through a few of those today, having seen them put into action over the past five years, I'm definitely a reformed skeptic. Um, and I'm a certified project manager actually, which I know probably uh, a lot of you are too as engineers. And uh, I've actually seen them now as being more beneficial at the project level than even at the national or international level. So I'm hoping tonight to show you a bit of how that might work um, using my own expertise in climate policy to illustrate an example of this. So before I begin, I think we all need to get on the same page about what sustainable development is because it's a buzzword that, that gets bandied about a lot. And oftentimes it's used to reference things like the, the financial viability of a company or a country and main, maintaining their financial stability. But the official definition actually comes from the World Commission on Environment and Development, also known as the Brundtland Commission, because it was chaired by the former Prime Minister of Norway, Gro Harlem Brundtland. And it was created as an organization that was independent of the United Nations to focus on environmental and developmental problems and solutions. So in that report, they define sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So let that sink in for a minute and think about your own area of work, like the computers that you use with materials mined from extractive industries, uh, the greenhouse gases that your enterprise might produce in their daily activities, the water that might be used. I actually think it's really hard to come up with an industry today that isn't somehow compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Uh, so that's really something to sink in when we're talking about sustainable development. About a decade after the Brundtland Commission released their report, uh, the United Nations then established eight Millennium Development Goals. And so they originated from a UN declaration called the Millennium Declaration, asserting that every individual has the right to dignity, freedom, equality, a basic standard of living that includes freedom from hunger and violence and encourages tolerance and sustainability or solidarity, sorry. And the, the Millennium Development Goals or the MDGs, they set 21 targets and um, measurable health and economic indicators for poverty reduction. So largely these are focused on poverty reduction. Uh, and so all of that is to help achieve the goal of poverty reduction and 191 United Nations member states committed to achieving those goals by 2015. So they were started in 2000 and they had 15 years to achieve those goals. And, and this was really the start of the global effort to tackle poverty. And actually for those 15 years, those goals drove significant progress. And we can debate how much the UN was involved, but they did kickstart a global movement um, for free primary education. And they made huge strides in combating things like HIV AIDS and other diseases like malaria and tuberculosis. So as much as we you know, criticize the UN for, for various things, I mean, we can say that since 1990, more than a billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty, child mortality and the number of children out of school has dropped by more than half. HIV AIDS infections fell by almost 40% since 2000. So yes, prior to the enactment of the Millennium Development Goals, there were plenty of individual campaigns that were aimed at these, at these issues, but they hadn't been approached with a, a global perspective or at a global level before the Millennium Development Goals. So they were significant in, in a lot of ways, but obviously 2015 came and the Millennium De Development Goals essentially needed an, an update and we were still a long way from addressing all the global challenges um, and particularly I think recognizing and this is a this is a chronic problem in policy development and everything, uh, recognizing the interconnectedness of our natural environment and our way of life. So the sustainable development goals really go a step further than the millennium development goals. You can see that instead of eight goals, we have 17 goals now, that's, a, that's an obvious one. Um, another big change between the millennium development goals and the sustainable development goals was that the MDGs were really applied to developing countries. They were about developing countries, lifting them out of poverty, but the SDGs apply universally to all member states. So, you know, as much for developing countries as even for Ireland to get their house in order too. So that is uh, different. Um, and then you can see that 
environment isn't just an add-on. In the last one, it was just sustainable environment, but in this one, it underpins all other goals. So it's not just poverty reduction, it's about environment, economy, society, uh, all of the environmental issues are embedded like urban areas, water, sanitation, energy, climate change. They're all prominently featured. Um, and then a final difference is how the SDGs were crafted. So it was considered an unparalleled participatory process. It involved 70 countries sharing 30 seats and then incorporating a lot of stakeholders, including civil society, uh, local government, and the private sector. So uh, a, a bit of an update to the MDGs, maybe a little overwhelming if you're looking at 17 instead of eight. And so I, there's a lot of different ways to bundle them, but I quite like this one from the Stockholm Re Resilience um, Institute, which is actually, the same uh, center that, that developed the planetary boundaries. So if you're interested in environmental issues and seeing how we are dealing with environmental issues globally, the Stockholm Resilience Center has some very good graphics on planetary boundaries and how we're approaching them. And so they've done a nice way of grouping the sustainable development goals um, into biosphere society and economy and of course partnership uh, filters through all of those issues. So that's a, another way of looking at them. So just like the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals actually have targets too. In fact, they have a lot more of them. They have 169 interrelated targets. Uh, this is just a graphical de depiction of them so that you can show or see how interrelated they are. And to further overwhelm you, each target has indicators. Uh, you probably know uh, KPIs or key performance indicators. Each target essentially has a performance indicator or several indicators to measure um, success. And I know that that slide is actually very difficult to read, but it's just to show you all the different indicators and uh, the red, green, and yellow to show you the levels of data availability there. So red areas actually have no data, no trusted data to really measure them globally and green are areas where they're actually able to measure uh, how well those indicators are being achieved uh, at, a, at a global level. So it seems really complicated <laughs> and uh, to try and simplify it and make it a little less overwhelming and more relatable to daily practice, I'd like to take, uh, to take, some, take some time to look at the SDG that I'm most familiar with, which is number 13, take urgent action to combat climate change. So there are five targets associated with this goal. Um, one through three are applicable to countries, though I would argue that they could be applied to local governments, to businesses, or even at the project level. And A and B are quite specific to United Nations activities. So they're relating to strengthening the Paris Agreement's Global Climate Fund and helping developing countries cope with climate change. So I wanted to take the next few minutes to look at targets one through three um, to show the specific performance indicators for each of those. And while I do, I'd encourage you just to think about your own business, uh, your own organization, and how maybe you could re replace the word country with your organization's name to apply some of these targets to your own work. Um, I think particularly for uh, target 13.1, engineers are most comfortable with it because strengthening resilience and adapting to climate change usually involve design and construction. So two things that engineers are really good at. Um, and the SDGs were established in 2015. So their goal always relates to achieving things by 2030, which is now not that far away. But if you look at the performance indicators, you can see that particularly number two and number three are fairly vague. So um, Ireland actually ranks quite high in these issues of risk, uh, risk and disaster management, even though I think a lot of us would say we don't feel particularly resilient to that, especially when we see things like the DART uh, underwater just a week or two ago, and this is happening more frequently. So you can see how maybe the indicators uh, can can give people an impression of success at the country level that isn't quite uh, there. So again, target 13.2, this is integrating climate change measures into national policy. Ireland has a climate action plan that was established by the last government, but there's been plenty of analysis to say 
it's not particularly strong and it has unrealistic targets like for example having nearly a million electric vehicles on the road by 2030 when we currently only have 17,000 and um, that's actually the topic of debate for my show this week on News Talk if you're interested in it. But um, we can easily apply this target to any organization and I've worked with several companies in Ireland who are already doing so. I know there was a question sent in about what Engineers Ireland could do to help support the climate and biodiversity crisis and, and a great question. Um, and I think actually the training and facilitation and incorporating the SDG targets into your company strategic plans um, is something that Engineers Ireland could really help with um, in particular in integrating the SDGs. So finally, target 13.3, climate education. This is a huge uh, issue to me, and it's, I think, a huge problem in Ireland, probably in other parts of the world too. Um, but this is something I'm seeing companies embracing more and more of um, and bringing organizations like Cool Planet, which is one that I work closely with, to train staff or to even train board members about the basics of climate change and probably more importantly, what they can do to help support the low carbon transition. So what I'm finding is that people have a lot of questions. Um, they've heard a lot of things on the radio about climate change that they want answers to, uh, or they want clarification on. Um, and they really need some time to kind of workshop through the issue uh, and figure out how they can integrate those, those things into their daily practice. So um, I wanted to take a little bit of time to give you a taster of the kind of topics we cover in that climate training. So some of this might be review to those of you who already know a lot about climate change, but I actually think that it's no harm to be reminded about these things and to see uh, where we're at in a, addressing the climate crisis. So the first thing I wanna show you is something called a spirograph. And this is just um, showing you the temperature of the earth on average month by month uh, since before the industrial revolution and then going on to, to 2017 is how far this one goes. And those two rings, one is uh, 1.5 degrees and the other is two degrees. That's what we've established in the Paris Climate Agreement. So we aim to keep the world's average atmospheric temperature well below two degrees of warming and ideally below 1.5 degrees of warming to uh, help protect low-lying islands and low-lying countries who are more susceptible to sea level rise. And if you watch that spirograph, I think um, you can see very quickly that we are really approaching that 1.5 degree limit uh, quite soon. So we've already raised the earth temperature just over one degree, and we're really running out of time to meet the, the ambition of the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, so, I could talk all day about all the different impacts uh, of climate change and every day I find another uh, shocking impact um, that kind of blows my mind. But I think the important thing just to say about that is that with every degree that the earth warms, the, the impacts get worse. And so we've already warmed by one degree. So you can see we're starting to, to see some of those those issues on the bottom right there, like coral bleaching and species extinction and, and water supply being affected. But we're projected to raise the Earth's temperature by somewhere between three and a half to four degrees by the end of the century. So you get up to the other side of the, the graphic there and you know four degrees basically becomes uninhabitable for, for human civilization as we know it. Um, so this is the issue that really keeps me up at night. Um, I'm not trying to save the planet. I'm really trying to save uh, civilization and, and try and maintain our quality of life so that future generations can avail of the same or, or better quality of life. Another thing that I think is uh, worth remembering is that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, which do a lot of um, scenario predicting on, you know, what the impacts of climate change might be like, uh, depending on our emissions. They're, they're amazing resources, but they're generally conservative and underestimate the impacts. So part of that is because scientists are, are naturally conservative and tend to couch everything in terms of levels of uncertainty. Um, but another part of that is that um, all of these reports are, are approved by their governments and therefore um, Obviously, governments, uh, you know, are kind of conservative in, in how they want to emphasize the impacts of the damage that they're doing. So more and more you are hearing uh, scientists saying everything is happening faster than forecast, that we didn't expect things to happen um, as fast as they are. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind, that we don't really 
uh, we can't really afford to leave this on the long finger now. So like, you know, it's not incorporating the sustainable development goals is something that has to happen now rather than something we can push on for five years. Um, and what makes this such a wicked problem really is that almost everything we do as humans affects climate change. And that's largely because we have thrived off the invention of the internal combustion engine. It's helped us produce food. It's helped us improve our healthcare. It's helped us grow our population uh, to the 7 billion <laughs> that we have on earth today. And, and so I'm sure a lot of you will look at, at this graphic and see your own businesses and your own activities represented here. Um, and it makes it very, very hard to solve a problem when so much of what we do has to change. So the IPCC has written um, a really good report uh, on how to achieve uh, the goal of Paris to stay under 1.5 degrees. And you might have heard this reported in the media a couple of years ago. The headline was, we have 10 years to solve climate change. And uh, it was coming off this report, but it's kind of a simplistic way of saying uh, what was actually said in the report. So what they said was in order to have a 66% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees, we would need to reduce emissions by nearly half uh, between 2010 and 2030. So that's the kind of 10 years, which is out now nine years, um, and then reach net zero by 2050. So that is where the new ambition in Europe and in Ireland to have net zero emissions by 2050 is coming from. That's where the commitment from government to reduce emissions by 7% is coming from. It's all in relation to this requirement to have radical emissions reductions uh, in the next decade in order to meet this uh, 1.5 degree goal. It's also why people like Mark Carney from the Bank of England have been saying for a long time that the vast majority of fossil fuel reserves are unburnable or why uh, campaign groups have been chanting, keep it in the ground because to stay below two degrees of warming, we have to keep 80% of our known fossil fuel reserves in the ground. That's all the fossil fuel that we already know we have. So there's no point in looking for more fossil fuel, more oil and gas, because we can't burn it anyway if we're serious about addressing climate change. And that's what's making a lot of our fossil fuel reserves a stranded asset and sending uh, investment companies into a bit of a panic. Um, but that is the reality of the situation if we're going to address climate change. So on the positive side, we now have all the technology <laughs> to address this problem. So thank God we can move to a, a you know, fully renewable fossil free system. And, and while we're not seeing enough growth in this sector, we are seeing rapid growth in it nonetheless, and that will continue. So even for Ireland, um, we're, we're number one in Europe now for wind, onshore wind energy penetration, um, but we need to move to an offshore system where we could have much, much better capacity. Um, and, and that probably is in the pipeline very soon. And the same is happening globally for solar, though we're not seeing it as much for Ireland, but um, that's simply due to a policy uh, decision and, and we need to actually change our policy so we can avail of the rooftop revolution that's going on around the world with respect to solar. Um, and, and certainly batteries and all of the technology that's coming out now, there's trials going on in Belfast with uh, hydrogen fuel or synthetic fuel as a storage for uh, excess wind energy. Um, that's all adding to the potential. So even the ESB has said that in Ireland, they think up to a third of our homes could be producing all of their own electricity by 2030. And in my own home, I have six solar panels and two storage batteries, and I'm producing 30% of my own electricity just from that little system. So, you know, we add a bit of microgen wind or something like that to the system, and um, the potential is, is there to, to do that. So it's an exciting time, I think, in the energy sector. And this is also a really um, huge opportunity for developing countries. So places like Nigeria, where you have 40% of the population still without any access to electricity, this kind of large grid infrastructure um, is just makes it really challenging for them to develop and give access to electricity because it's expensive and it, it involves a lot of government investment. So renewable energies 
are paving the way for them to develop in a way they haven't before. So you can have these kind of pay-as-you-go solar panels, um, much easier to install, um, much smaller scale. And this is a photo that Al Gore uses a lot in his presentations, the pay-as-you-go solar power thing. But I just took the chance uh, to look at them in relation to the sustainable development goals to see which goals um, a little project like this might actually uh, apply to. And so obviously we can see goal number seven, affordable clean energy. That's an obvious one. Even climate action, we can see how it has a positive effect on climate action. But then if you think about it a little further, um, this is a this is could be a shop. So this could be a shop that can now stay open late because it has electricity and lights and you know maybe refrigeration. Um, so that is impacting economic growth, uh, which is goal number eight, or it's you know impacting the poverty issue, goal number one, uh, potentially impacting reduced inequalities because now you have more equal access to power. Um, maybe it's even improving goal number fifteen, life on land, because now you're not extracting fossil fuels for energy as much, and you're potentially enhancing biodiversity and clean air. Um, so there are a lot of things. Now, it could be someone's house and there could be children living in it that can now uh, do homework at night. And so this is improving their education. So it's really amazing when you think about it, how one project, which you think is just being done to address climate change, can actually have all these other benefits to the sustainable development goals. On a bigger scale, um, here's an example done in the journal Nature Communications where uh, the authors looked at um, artificial intelligence and they mapped the artificial intelligence sector, which is a big sector I know, to the sustainable development goals. And what I like about this is they looked at them not only in terms of their positive impacts on the SDGs, but also admitted that there are some negative impacts on the sustainable development goals. You know, So this kind of mapping exercise I think could be really useful on a company level or on a project level too, uh, just to acknowledge that there's always the potential that something you're doing could harm the sustainable development goals and should be addressed in some way. So we could do something similar in Ireland. You know, we, we have this vision of having fully fossil fuel free energy in Ireland and a green plan Ireland by Dr. David Conley, which was peer reviewed in 2014, um, said that we could have a fully renewable energy sector and create 100,000 new jobs in the process. So obviously there's a couple of sustainable development goals being filled there, but we could take this further and we could look at what other sustainable development goals, what's the impact on life and land and biodiversity, what's the impact on, you know, um, poverty or all, all of them, we could probably strengthen the argument to, to go fossil fuel free um, if we incorporated all the sustainable development goals into that. We're at a really exciting time right now in Ireland's climate policy. So one example is in the last budget, uh, the government uh, increased the amount of money going into deep energy retrofit for homes by 80%. So unprecedented amount of money uh, going into energy retrofit. And a lot of it is going to um, deprive communities or council housing, people in fuel poverty. Um, but again, we could be benchmarking this against the SDGs to find a way of, of figuring out where resources are best spent um, with, with that in mind and what the co-benefits could be. Uh, I see that Brian Ledden is coming next week, which is great because he can talk to you in great detail about the exciting new developments around amending uh, the current climate legislation. But just to briefly mention, um, it will have a greater ambition than the current legislation. It will set carbon budgets uh, into, into law, hopefully, um, for each sector. So that will really uh, change things in Ireland with respect to the sectoral emissions. Um, and then another interesting thing is that it establishes expertise in the Climate Advisory Council that not only looks at climate change and economics and all the things that the previous Climate Advisory Council looked at, but also recognizes the importance of things like biodiversity and water quality and the other environmental issues. So that's something to watch out for. Um, Europe is very much moving to this idea of a, a circular economy. So away from a linear disposable economy of make, take and throw away to this idea where the waste from one industry has to be the fuel for the next. And so we're seeing some interesting policies coming out of Europe around the circular economy action plan and the farm to fork strategy, which really looks at a more sustainable uh, food production system. And then that's kind of trickling into Irish policy and our own waste action plan, which will have um, 
a push toward fully recyclable packaging and a deposit and return scheme for plastic bottles. So moving toward that circular model here in Ireland too. So um, again, lots of developments to, to look out for. And then across the pond and in Europe, we have this moment that started before the pandemic, but I think it's even more relevant now, where Roosevelt's idea of a green deal, which was, or, or uh, sorry, a, a, a new deal, which was something that he, he came up with to address the Great Depression in the United States. So he had all these laborers that were unemployed and he employed them to do things like uh, that build the trails in the national parks as part of the civilian conservation core and build a lot of America's large infrastructure. So that concept is now being applied uh, and it's even more relevant as we come out of the, the pandemic and the economic damage of that, that we spend money and create jobs uh, to make this green transition. Um, and we see it as a real employment opportunity too, which is, is you know, in line with the sustainable development goals. So the SDGs are kind of happening even when they're not linked directly to it. So I liked that Biden uh, two weeks ago when he announced his climate plans in the White House, he said, um, it's climate day at the White House, which means it's jobs day at the White House. And I think that linkage between the two um, is really uh, creating more impact and, and making things more likely to happen. So it's um, really important to mention that we not only have a climate crisis to deal with, and Ireland declared a climate emergency just nearly 18 months ago, uh, but we also have a biodiversity crisis that we're dealing with globally and also here in Ireland. And possibly the biodiversity crisis is actually worse than the climate crisis because it's exacerbated by climate change and because we're so dependent on a lot of these species that are, are now threatened. Um, so it's really important when you are looking at your environmental impact and everything that you not consider these issues in silo because the risk is a lot of companies go off and calculate their carbon footprints and down but sometimes we can try and address climate change and we end up harming biodiversity or harming air pollution or harming water pollution if we don't think of them all together and that's where the sustainable development goals can be really powerful because they force you to think about all of these issues instead of just thinking about them in silos. So I wanted to show you um, how Ireland may be doing <laughs> on the SDGs. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure about this analysis. It comes from PwC and business in the community. And it took 99 of the SDG targets that businesses felt were most important to them. And it mapped Ireland against them. And you know, as an example of why I'm a little bit skeptical, skeptical of, of SDGs with respect to countries, if you just look at the climate target, which is the dark green tiny line um, at the bottom, uh, it ranks Ireland as, as quite good on the climate targets. And if you've been following the climate issue, you know, that, that seems a bit confusing. We're often referred to as the laggards in Europe on climate and everything. And again, it's simply because we have a climate action plan. So in regards to the targets, that box is ticked. It doesn't have to be a good climate action plan. It doesn't have to be an effective climate action plan. We have a plan. Um, and so that's where I think that the SDGs can maybe um, mask a lot of problems when it comes to countries. But here's an example from Australia of where I think it can be really useful. So this is a paper published in Nature Sustainability last year. Uh, and it's looking at four different development scenarios in Australia. So they're represented by the one, two, three, four, which goes all the way around the dial. So each of these development scenarios will have different impacts on the SDGs. And this graphic is trying to see what those impacts will be. And I really like this because it's using the SDGs as a decision-making tool for which development plan to go with. Um, and so that's something where the SDGs could hold a lot of potential in using them as a decision against maybe two different scenarios or several different projects um, in terms of evaluating their sustainability. For the engineers in water in particular, I think this example is really useful. So Denmark's water utilities have been leading the way in uh, adopting the SDGs to their practices. And so one thing they did was just figure out what are the core tasks of a water company? So obviously clean water and sanitation, goal number six is the obvious one, but they also felt that climate action and sustainable cities and communities was part of their core mandate too. Um, and then they, they found some goals that maybe were, 
other other parts of society were dependent on them for like life below water, um, though maybe not directly related to. And then other goals that they felt were really important to them, like gender equality. And so all of these were designed to try and serve their customers or their clients or their communities better. And once they did this mapping exercise, they then changed the whole vision statement of their organization to align with the sustainability goals. And they even use these goals as a way of communicating with customers and with school children. So when they were doing something, they would put the relevant sustainable goals there and try and link their work to the kind of global problems, which I think is a really interesting way uh, of using the goals. And it also gave them a justification for doing things they might not have done otherwise. So for example, instead of just focusing on water, they could also think about energy recovery in their plants in order to achieve uh, the other goals. So um, I thought that was an interesting example. And if you're interested in more detail on that, all of this is written up in Source Magazine with a lot more information. So um, if it's relevant to you, I encourage you to take a look. So just to summarize, and I hope I've given you examples of this, but for me, I think actually the SDGs are more valuable probably in our daily practice and in our projects than they are even at a national level. And the reason I say that is um, one of the things companies are always asking me and people are always asking me is what's the number one thing I can do to address climate change? Um, I think one of the questions that came in was what's the low hanging fruit in relation to the SDGs? And the first thing I would say is just measuring, just knowing your baseline. So measuring your carbon footprint or measuring where you are in addressing the SDGs and the targets um, is the first and easiest thing you can do uh, to start the process. And then being transparent about it because um, I find in companies, transparency is really lacking on environmental issues. Um, if you just take fashion, for example, which is something a lot of people are really into, it's impossible to figure out how your clothes are being made and what the impacts are. Like it really takes a lot of digging. Um, and usually it's an NGO that <laughs> has to do all that work. So, you know, if you can, post your how you're doing your SDGs um, and be transparent about that. I think that's a really useful first step. Um, the other thing that's useful is that, you know, a lot of um, companies I talk to are afraid of being branded with that horrible greenwashing label. So for example, they want to go with paperless billing um, as a measure to kind of address their environmental impact, but they think they're gonna be accused of just trying to save money and that it's just a greenwashing thing. Um, so the SDGs can be used as a framework to really demonstrate true sustainability and try and get away from that label of greenwashing or being disingenuous. Um, also useful as a decision-making tool. And I think I showed you the example of Australia and the different scenarios. So that's an example of making decisions against um, different projects or scenarios. And then um, the artificial intelligence example of where they looked at whether or not they were doing harm to the SDGs. Um, the overall principle of the SDGs is to do good, do no harm, and leave no one behind. So um, by mapping projects against the SDGs, you're, you can also make sure that, that you're not doing any harm to. And then finally, I think, um, and this is where I've seen this be very useful at the county council level, using the SDGs to justify funding certain projects um, or to ask for funding for certain projects. Uh, and I think the example I gave you of the grass hut with the pay-as-you-go solar on it uh, is an example of where if you had just pitched that as a climate action or renewable energy project, it doesn't have as much impact as when you then link it to all the other SDGs around equality and income and poverty uh, as it does just as a renewable project. So it is an opportunity uh, to seek more funding or to fund projects maybe that wouldn't have gotten uh, funding uh, otherwise. So you guys as engineers are are here in Ireland at a really exciting time when a lot of decisions are being made about how to make the low carbon transition. And uh, this is just a map from Cool Planet of some of the decisions that need to be made and the locations are not indicative of where they should be made. So please don't misinterpret that. Uh, but I do think that if, if you have any project management experience, you know that we have lots of different tools in our toolkits as project managers. And uh, what I hope that I've given you today is another tool for your toolkit so that you can make sure that your projects are truly sustainable in addition to being on time and within budget. Thank you very much. Thank you, 
very much, Cara. It was a brilliant talk, and I can see that there are loads of questions coming in. Um, I may just start from what you just mentioned uh, just uh, just a minute ago um, about about you know using SDGs and how to use SDGs best. Um, so there is the question coming in. Um, local authorities are in the process of updating development plans. Do you think the Australian example of using SDGs as a way to decide which development plan to go with could be applied at local government level? If so, how could this be done? Yeah, I, I think absolutely it could be applied. Um, I, I think mapping, it, there's like life cycle analysis and everything. There's a, a lot of assumptions that have to be made and everything. And so I would point people to that article because that was a peer reviewed article where they were using Australia as an example, and they set the process of how to actually go about this. So it's great that there's published research out there that shows how this could be applied, but I think it could be applied to anything, um, including local government and development plans. Um, and I think it's a really good opportunity to do that. Thanks. Um, you kind of mentioned this already a little bit, but maybe you want to, you want to uh, kind of say it uh, again or mention it in, in terms of Ireland. So if you had the chance to see three things happen in Ireland to make us more sustainable, what would you do? <laughs> three things. Uh, carbon budgets in each sector would, would be huge. The reason we haven't uh, reduced emissions, like we have, we have lots of ambition to reduce emissions and we've signed up to Paris and everything, but because we never impose budgets on each sector, every sector just said, it's not my problem. You know, transport said, not our problem. Uh, energy has actually done a pretty good job in reducing emissions, um, but like we can't expect energy to do it all. Agriculture didn't feel it was their responsibility to reduce emissions because of their economic importance and you know importance in rural Ireland. So it just let everybody off the hook. So carbon budgets for sure. Um, then I think we have a massive problem with uh, biodiversity. Um, I think it's getting ignored. I know we declared a biodiversity crisis, but I don't see any sign that we're addressing it. We're definitely addressing climate action much more than biodiversity. Um, so I think uh, we're supposed to have a citizens assembly on biodiversity. That hasn't happened yet, but that would be a great start um, because we did that on climate change and it was very successful. So I'd like to see a citizens assembly on biodiversity. Um, and then God, it's hard to narrow down to just one more because uh, we have an air pollution issue and we have a water pollution issue. Um, so I think it would probably be something around agriculture and uh, making agriculture much more sustainable. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I wouldn't prescribe just one way, but um, I think if we could really get into, get away from the idea of um, intensity of beef and dairy and move toward a more diverse system with more organic and more horticulture uh, and a different model of how we pay farmers uh, and give farmers a fair price for their food and maybe have a direct relationship with their consumers. Um, yeah, the whole model of agriculture, I'd love to see change. Okay, lovely. And just to kind of uh, something relating to the carbon budget that you mentioned as your first thing that you think should be changed. Uh, there is a question, uh, when will the airline industry be brought into the annual assessment of greenhouse gases? Yeah, um, it is in the assessment under the EU. Um, so we, we do within the EU uh, look at aviation um, and under the emissions trading scheme. Um, it's obviously hard, we can't, because aviation is a cross-border thing, it's very hard to, to attribute emissions to any one particular country. Um, so that's the issue with aviation um, and it's not part of the Paris Climate Agreement and it, it won't be. So uh, I don't see us bringing it in in Ireland. Where I think Ireland does have an opportunity with aviation is the fact that we're one of the biggest um, leasing countries. So we lease, we have a lot of companies here that lease um, planes. And I really think it's a missed opportunity that we're not trying to address aviation through that position um, and trying to force aviation to look at their emissions more closely through the leasing of planes. Okay. Um, and then there is a question kind of similar uh, in, in terms of, you know, uh, Ireland is here and Ireland is doing 
uh, what they can, but uh, when China with 28% of world emissions being let off the hook by the Paris Agreement for the next 10 years, uh, with their emissions set to double in the next 10 years, 50, 52% of current world emissions, why should Ireland having a tiny amount of emissions uh, reduce emissions? So with 52% of current world emissions from China in 10 years time, uh, this will wipe out all the efforts made by all the other countries. Well, there's a few things to say about that. And it's the most common uh, comment you get in the media and everything. I mean, first is the reason China's emissions are so high is not because the Chinese people have such lavish, lavish lifestyles. It's because they are feeding a European market and they, you know how many of our products came from China. Um, and so it's all that manufacturing of products that we buy. Uh, so it's just the way that we cut the emissions pie that we say when it's made in China, it's their emissions. But the reality is there are emissions because we're buying these products uh, and that's just not the way things are divided. So I think it's very unfair to, to label China unless you're gonna stop buying products from China, which I don't know anybody who isn't. Um, so that's the first thing they, as as a population, they have a relatively low carbon footprint compared to people like us in Europe, you know, which were like 13 tons of carbon per year on average here in Ireland. And, uh, you know, someone in Africa is more around four. Um, so I think we have to be really mindful of that. And the other thing is too, it's it's the old adage of the prisoner's dilemma. I don't know if you, if you know that, uh, that kind of economic game that's sometimes played where we've committed all 200 countries have committed to the Paris Agreement. We've all said we will do our fair share uh, to re reduce emissions. And Ireland, as, as, a, as a society with a very high carbon footprint, and our lifestyle is very high carbon, uh, we have an obligation to do our fair share. So we can't uh, just go, well, you know, sure, they're, they're not doing uh, enough, and therefore we shouldn't do enough or anything, or else the problem will not get solved. And that's, you know, that's the prisoner's dilemma. Um, so that's, that's the other um, issue, and I had one more one more point about that because this is a real pet peeve, but I, um, I forgot I completely forgotten what it is. Um, but anyway, I yeah, I just really feel strongly that we uh, we have an obligation to reduce our emissions. Oh, I know what the last thing is. This whole thing that China's not doing anything is just a complete myth. So look at it. Look at a province like Shenzhen where they have seven million people and they have a fully fossil fuel free electrified. Uh, taxi system and bus system. Uh, China it has outpaced the entire world on solar panel installation. Um, their emissions are going to peak early, actually earlier than the, what they committed in Paris. So they are doing way more than Ireland in reality. We're way behind on this. So um, yeah, that's some myth busting for you. Thanks very much. We always need one of those on, on, the, on the seminars or webinars. Um, then there is the question about the onshore wind energy. So you, you mentioned that um, wind uh, onshore wind energy in Ireland, there have been a number of sites where there was a huge environmental issues as a result of the wind farm. So how uh, can we ensure that environmental protections aren't overlooked in order to scale up onshore wind uh, energy plants? Yeah, I mean, the, the current... Um developments on onshore wind are gonna make it very hard for any onshore wind to be developed in the future because the, the set away distance is even, is even higher and uh, the noise uh, restrictions at the moment are almost impossible to even measure. Uh, so I, I don't see on, onshore wind really developing uh, that much in the future. It's gonna be offshore wind really. Um, so there'll be environmental impacts from offshore wind too, in terms of the impact on the marine and on our views, if we have, you know, views of the ocean or those, so, that, so that's all part of it too. Um, they all have to undergo environmental impact assessment. Um, hopefully these things get mapped to SDGs even, and they're even more robust. Um, but there's always gonna be impacts of anything we do. So it's about trade-offs. Is it, you know, is the fossil fuel that we're importing that maybe is someone else's problem when it comes to extraction are the negative environmental impacts, impacts of that with respect to climate change and air pollution uh, better or worse than the environmental impacts being created by a renewable energy project, for example? And are the costs, you know, um, are the costs better or worse? Okay. 
And just at the beginning of your talk, when you introduced the SDGs, you mentioned that at the beginning you were a skeptic of, of them. You know, you weren't sure if they if they would do what they, they were promised to do. And uh, now you kind of bought in the idea a little bit, but but you're still, you have your reservations. So um, there is a question on local authorities again. So they're preparing their development plans currently. So do you think that the local authorities should adopt the SDGs as a framework for their development plans? Yes, I think it's really, really good as the framework uh, for any kind of decision-making or, um, uh, scenario testing or any kind of transparency to the public. I think um, it makes it uh, manageable for the public to kind of digest what your impacts are. So I actually think the smaller scale, the more impact the SDGs can have. And where my reservations lie is when countries, you know, proclaim that they are so great in complying to the SDGs because they happen to have a plan, but it may not be a good plan. You know, that's, that's my problem with them. Okay. And now we're just uh, moving uh, back to engineers. So um, are there particular SDGs where you think engineers should play a leading role and how can the SDGs be embedded in engineering projects? So you kind of, you know, mentioned few examples in your talk, but maybe you want to say a little more uh, particularly on this, you know, how, how the SDGs can be embedded in, in engineering projects. Yeah, I think any of the ones that involve design and uh, construction, I think are really obvious ones for the engineering sector to take a lead on. So, you know, any of the climate action ones uh, are, are obvious and the renewable energy ones are obvious. Um, even, you know, the life life on land and life below water and everything there, there you know, there's elements of design and engineering in those too. So, um, and then I think maybe the other ones around gender, uh, equality and poverty and everything are more um, secondary ones that, that don't have a direct relationship, but should be considered in any project anyway. And um, in environmental responses, solving one problem often creates another. Are there specific SDGs uh, that seem to come into conflict with each other? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I think when I was when I was stating that example, so so I'll just give you an example of this: um, the uh, diesel vehicle, you know, the government, the government in about two thousand seven eight changed the motor taxes to incentivize diesel vehicles, and this was done in a in a with a plan to help with fuel economy and address climate change because diesel vehicles were considered more efficient. And we've now found out that um, okay, first of all, some car companies lied about their emissions, and second of all, it turns out diesel vehicles are worse from an air pollution. So we're now we're now actually creating an air pollution problem as a result of all we went from 30% diesel vehicles to 70% vehicle uh, diesel vehicles practically overnight. So that's one example. Um, another example would be uh, forestry. So we have huge forestry targets now to plant a lot of trees in Ireland uh, to address climate change. But if we plant monoculture Sitka spruce everywhere, uh, we actually ruin the biodiversity. We, we, we t biodiversity from semi-grazed grassland is actually better than biodiversity in a Sitka spruce monoculture forest. Um, so there's an example where we're, we're trying to address climate change, but we're harming uh, biodiversity. So I guess um, I'm seeing it from a more specific decision-making rather than, I don't think, I think the SDGs are kind of general enough that they don't actually interfere, but there could be specific examples where they do, depending on your decisions. Okay. Uh, we're getting into kind of more detailed questions, so I'm just trying to pick them just to, to have a, you know, broad topics covered. Um, so this one is uh, about Germany leading the way on domestic solar PV. Um, and the question is, why isn't the government in Ireland giving out grants for domestic users, not for installers to make money uh, by, you know, installing the PV panels, inflated prices of solar, uh, as sure there is a grant isn't acceptable and it isn't encouraging people to switch. So what can be done to stop this, this practice? 
Yeah, this is really frustrating that we aren't having this rooftop revolution that the rest of the world is having. So there, I mean, there is a grant for solar panels, but the cost of installation has gone up uh, probably in line with the grant. So it, um, it's not, the payback period is still about seven years. And uh, when I looked at them 10 years ago, the payback period was seven years, even though the costs of the solar panels are going down. So it's really frustrating. And then on top of that, um, householders don't get any kind of, um, uh, money back for any excess electricity that they're providing to the grid, which is also frustrating. And it looks like the renewable energy support scheme that's currently under consultation is now saying that um, buildings would have to be kind of a energy rating before they would even get the grant to put solar panels on their house. Now, um, Eamon Ryan in episode two of my down to earth uh, show uh, defined Ended this position and he had some arguments for why we should be energy retrofitting our buildings before we go allocating grants for solar panels and I accept those arguments but at the same time it is a bit weird that say a, 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 a agricultural building which doesn't need to be a energy rated can't avail of that wonderful rooftop space to generate electricity. Um, and it has to be deep energy retrofitted before it can avail of the grants. So uh, Friends of the Earth has been engaging on this issue a lot at the policy and legislative uh, level. Um, and they're trying to get the rules changed so that communities and individuals can be part of the renewable energy transition and that it's not just you know developer led. Okay. Um, do you, you mentioned climate education in your in your presentation. So, uh, do you think engineering education needs to change fundamentally so that traditional concrete solutions are not always the default option? So that climate friendly and nature based solutions are the first to be considered. Yeah, um, I think we have a long way to go uh, in in getting away from this like hard engineering design approach to kind of a softer, more nature based solution. And um, an example of that I can give, I went to graduate school in Los Angeles. And I don't know if you ever, well, you've probably seen the Terminator or the movie Grease, and they actually concrete channeled all of the rivers to, to deal with flooding. Um, oh gosh, I think it was in the 30s or something. Uh, and, and so that's had a horrible impact on nature and biodiversity and everything. And so now that same Army Corps of Engineers is going out and ripping up all that concrete channeling and trying to slow the water down and enhance biodiversity. And it's now becoming an immunity for like ecotourism ventures and everything. Um, and so you would think we would look at Los Angeles and go, okay, don't go concrete channeling our rivers or don't go channeling or trying to speed up the water. Uh, and yet we still are. I mean, I look at my own Dargo River here in Bray and it's all about speeding up the water as fast as possible and hard, hard engineering. Um, so I do think we have a long way to go and kind of looking toward nature instead of just concreting everything, you know? Um, so here is the question about the about the waste. Uh, so do you think the government and we as a society are missing an opportunity to capture all the waste heat uh, that's a, that is dumped from uh, centers every minute of the day? Do you know if any policy changes regarding design and planning of these centers that are coming? Um, on the uh, one Irish data center I know of planning on district heating yeah, it's um, it's a topic I've only just kind of started exploring uh, through my show. And uh, David Conley spoke on episode two, and he's chairperson of the District Heating Energy Association, uh, and talked about this idea of how much heat we're wasting just going into the Liffey uh, that we could be using, you know, uh, much more efficiently. Um, so it's not something I'm super familiar with, uh, but it's definitely uh, being progressed through the District en uh, Heating Energy Association. So I'd encourage um, that person to, to check them out and maybe uh, join them in some way. And I do know, yeah, there is one data center where they are using district heating, but uh, I don't think it's a requirement uh, and it, it probably sh it should be. And I think they should probably be generating all their own renewable electricity too, um, because the demand that they're putting on our grid system is quite significant already and it's growing. Okay, um, and there is another uh, question about the, the education and about uh, career prospects. So this person uh, has been interested in and has studied academically in subjects relevant to the uh, sustainability and to climate change, uh, but have found it difficult uh, to access career opportunities related to the same to apply that knowledge. 
uh, have you got any suggestions for where job art opportunities exist? Yeah, uh, it, it has been in the past really frustrating. And obviously, as an academic, I'm constantly getting, uh, you know, contacted by students and prospective students that want jobs in in this area and there haven't been and I've always felt really bad I'm like there's no money in this don't don't do this but actually um, the moment that I felt things change was when I read the program for government and so that's what I would encourage um, that person to read because when you read the program for government it's very clear that there are tons of jobs coming in this transition I mean the program for government they they said it had it had green fingers everywhere um, and you can really clearly see where the priorities lie um, so things like deep energy retrofit or um, active transport and cycling infrastructure and things like that but uh, it's really clear there where the jobs are so that's what I'd encourage them to start by reading and then they might know which in industries to be looking toward okay thanks we're we're just uh, past an hour so I'll just take one last question uh, and we will wrap up after that um, so you mentioned that, you know, in your talk that everyone here, all engineers who are working in, in businesses and companies should think about their own business, their own organization and, and see how they could implement the SDGs in their organization and how to move towards more sustainable uh, practice. So would you have any advice regarding where to start preparing a company's sustainability strategy? Uh, I think it starts with a mapping exercise. So um, I would look at the SDGs and I, I put the website down, SDG Tracker, I think it's called um, on, on some of those slides there on the climate one. Um, so I would go somewhere like that and look at the targets uh, and maybe the indicators, but certainly the targets for each of the SDGs. And then just do some brainstorming on where your company fits in. How are they addressing that particular target? Maybe they're not, but just kind of map uh, your activities to those targets. Um, so doing that maybe at the board level or something um, as a brainstorming thing. And, and I think that would give you a clearer picture. One of the things we do in um, Cool Planet is we just sit down with the people in the room and have them list everything they could possibly do in each sector to um, move to a low carbon sector. And the list is endless, like the solutions are all there and it's just a matter of picking the ones that you wanna focus on. So I kind of do the brainstorming and then decide what you wanna focus on. What's the biggest bang for your buck or what's your biggest priority? Thanks, thanks very much, Cara. Um, I hope, I hope everyone enjoyed the talk, I, I definitely did. Um, and, you know, just to wrap up uh, the, the lessons that or the things that we can take home from, from this is, is that, you know, our planet and our society um, are facing many challenges and they're really important and they, they will have impact on, on the future generations. Um, and probably the biggest one is climate change, as you mentioned. Um, and, and the engineers who probably the majority of them are here today uh, play an important role uh, in creating and maintaining the world around us. Um, so they are specialists with, with the technical uh, skills to, to solve the, the problems. They're also integrators who, who you know, operate across boundaries between different disciplines uh, and they have basic skills uh, outside their, their own uh, work area or outside their own discipline. Um, and, and thanks to those skills, they, they can work on integrated and complex projects. Uh, but then engineers are also change engines and they, I think they should, they should learn from scientists uh, to, to, you know, to, to work, to provide that creativity, to provide innovation and leadership to, to tackle those challenges uh, such as climate change. Um, and, and I think it's really important, as you mentioned, the climate uh, education, um, you know, does that happen only in our schools, does not happen only in our third level institutions, but it also cap happens in our everyday uh, life, it happens in our organizations. Uh, so engineers are not only there uh, to work towards more resilient uh, cities, towards more resilient communities uh, and infrastructure, uh, but also to promote uh, to promote the ideas of sustainable development and and kind of trying to adapt and first tackle and then adapt to climate change. Um, so thanks very much, Kara. It was a pleasure to uh, to have you tonight, and I hope um, everyone will join the the next talks in the grant uh, in the sustainability grant tour series. Thank you.
Thanks so much. And thanks to everyone for the great turnout at a, a late hour of the night and for all the great questions. I really appreciate it. It's been really enjoyable. Thanks so much. <laughs>